Hello and a very warm welcome back to my channel, Richard Tang, CEO of Zen Internet. And today in the hot seat, I am delighted to have Neil MacArthur, MBE, CEO of Freedom Fibre. Very warm welcome, Neil. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Uh, before we get on to talking about Freedom Fibre and the Altnets, I described you earlier as one of the founding fathers of the internet, having set up Opal Telecom that became went on to become talked or really interesting story. Mm, well, it's been a bit generous, <laughs> family father, <laughs> grandfather, maybe. Um, no, no, no. Um, well, it's, Tell us a bit about that story. Yeah, sure. Um, well, how we got into telecoms is, is just fascinating, really, because we weren't in telecoms at all. We were in engineering, and uh, it was just uh, events at the time. And it really goes back to the mid-1990s um, when the UK, because we had that duopoly at the time of, of BT and Mercury, Cable and Wireless, and then they decided to deregulate the whole of the UK. And that created, you know, a, a major disruption in the market. And what you're looking for in new businesses is, is disruptive events. And we've got three things going on at that time. We've got a big kickoff in, in, in the demand for telecommunications. We've got deregulation going on and a big move towards digital comms. In other words, you know, computer science driving the, uh, you know, the applications and that. And when you've got three disruptive things like that, growth, technology and deregulation, you know, that's the opportunity. And we managed to get a bit of oxygen. So um, so Opal was, um, was actually, it was a B2B business. It was voice. So we were doing interconnected voice services and it was in the days when you could interconnect with BT and originate, terminate traffic and, and then start working with all the alt nets again. And of course, we were doing a bit of trading here and a bit of arbitrage here. But the serious bit was really the applications that were, you were delivering to businesses to improve their, um, you know, their quality of life and, and, and their um, effectiveness that, that really gave us the oxygen to build Opal. Um, but his breakthrough really came, uh, you know, when we met uh, Charles Dunson from Carphone, of course, you know, because we were running a, a nice little B2B business, which was with a bunch of smart people, you know, and um, we suddenly joined Carphone. Of course, they got access to a lot more capital and, uh, and Charles and the guys there were a lot more ambitious perhaps than we were. And, uh, and the, the business really took off, um, you know, from when we joined them in 2002. Um, and then, of course, in 2005, you know, um, the board wanted a broadband network and, and that's when the whole broadband revolution really kicked in. And so we scaled the business to uh, to get um, Talk Talk in, in, into broadband in that era. And, um, you know, you can guess the rest, really. And what happened beyond that? Uh, beyond Talk Talk, because you went on to do things with Fibre Nation, which was part of a well, it's all initiative much yeah. later. Yeah, well, I never left, really left to, to it, did I? So I ran tech in Talk Talk for eight years, which was great fun. I mean, you know, seriously, if you get a, you know, we were very engineering focused, but if you get a, a decent bunch of, of engineers and technical people and you put it with a, a class act in terms of retail, and that's what Carphone was really, and uh, it, 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 the business took off because we were good at delivery, good at building networks, and, you know, really good at, at the whole retail side. And that. so it was a great eight years. And, you know, we, we when we launched uh, Broadband in 2005, I mean, God, we were inundated with it in customers and we were years sorting it out. And then we consolidated chunks of the industry and ended up with 4 million customers and what, about 18% of the market, something at the time. So it was a busy time, you know, and, um, and you know, it was a proverbial duck. It was very busy under the water, making things look calm on top. But, you know, great time. And then in 2010, of course, you know, it, it outgrew Carphone Talk Talk. So it demerged and became a, a company in its own its own right. Um, but like all things, it come to an end and it was time to sort of hand over to the guys that had, um, that were coming up behind us, really. And I, but I stayed around with Talk Talk, sort of working on various projects and never quite um, never quite handed me passing, if you know what I mean. And then Fibre came along, didn't it? So, um, you know, started getting back on the pitch again when, when Fibre came along and um, um, Talk Talk set up Fibre Nation, of course. Uh, which ended up um, uh, being part of uh, City Fibre today, of course. And then, um, you know, we still felt there was a bit of an unfinished business and uh, COVID was around, so decision was made. We'd set up Freedom Fibre and have another little roll of the dice before we finally, um, um, you know, pick up the golf clubs, really. <laughs> so, so Freedom Fibre and the Alt are such an interesting time yeah. in the Altnet industry. If I look back a year or two, it felt like a gold rush and like, 
everyone was building as yep. fast as they could, all guns blazing, investors were just piling in money for yep. fun. And now this year, it sort of feels like um, things are a bit tougher for the, in the alt net world. Yep. Obviously, interest rates are higher. A lot of the alt nets have got are funded at least in part by debt, so the cost yep. of that the cost of debt has gone up. Um, I mean, how does it feel being an alt net through mm. you know the last? three years since Freedom Fiber mm -hmm. came into being. Mm -hmm. How does it feel now, I guess, for you, but for the industry as a whole, how is it feeling? Um, well, you're, you're spot on with it. It is, it is getting tougher, but, you know, we've been here before, haven't we? I mean, if you go back to the voice days, you know, in the late 90s, there was the same thing going on there with that massive influx of capital. You know, when we were running Opal, there were 200 licensed operators in the UK. It was a Wild West and there was an awful lot of funds um, flowed into the the voice market and the companies setting up and everywhere. And, you know, we figured our way through it and, and we survived those, that era. And, you, of course, you end up with that period of consolidation. Well, you've got the same position now, haven't you? You've got this this alt-net community. And technically, you know, there's, there's 140 registered alt-nets in the UK. But if you look at, you know, seriously, you can probably, there's less than 50... I think substantial ones with major infrastructure funds behind them, uh, and what you're going to see ultimately, of course, is a consolidation. You know, and it, it's starting to happen a little bit now. Um, but the the industries, it's like I guess it's like all technology industries. When you get a new technology coming along, and and fiber is a pretty good new technology, and it is capable of delivering tremendous improvements in in, in telecoms, both consumer and B two B. Then you're going to get that influx of capital because that's what the capital providers do, and the infra funds particularly. Uh, we've had that influx of capital, and I think there's something like 17 billion of, of top line committed funds, if you like, um, to to the outlet community, and that's going to deliver an awful lot of uh, of the fibre in the UK. You know, and the government must be kicking itself really because it feeling so sorry, pinching itself really because it must feel that great that there's been so much private capital coming in. If you think about it, we're going to get the whole country fibred up probably in the next five to seven years, you know. And that, yeah, excuse me, I'm just turn this off. And um, it, it, it's not going to take, you know, that long to get the whole country fibred up. And they're only going to um, subsidise it to the tune of five billion pounds. And when you think about the economic impact that telecoms has on the economy, it's so small an amount of money to have to uh, put in. So from a, a UK PLC point of view, fantastic news. We're going to have the country fibred up. Industry, meanwhile, is going to have to sort itself out a bit. And uh, and you, you're not wrong. Things are tightening up. The cost of capital has gone up. Um, capital is getting harder to acquire. Business cases are being examined closer. And we're ultimately going to see this, this consolidation. And maybe that's no bad thing. The key to the consolidation, though, you know, and I feel very passionate about this in engineer, really, is to making sure that it's a capital efficient consolidation. Because the last thing we want to see is the destruction of capital. You know, um, the best thing we can see really is is that you know one on one equals three when you start consolidating. You know, the the, the businesses starting to happen. Let's just hope it goes nice and orderly and uh, and smoothly. But we'll see. Well, well, definitely. And I believe you, you've you've built about one hundred and ten thousand premises now. Where where are they? <laughs> a lot a lot around yeah. here. Um, yeah, we've we're based in uh, Greater Manchester, of course, on the west of Greater Manchester. So we're building a chunk to the the north side and, and south side of Manchester. So in the west of Manchester, but we're on North Cheshire. Um, and we just want a, a gigabit project, which is which is rural or, uh, in in Shropshire, so we sort of south of Whitchurch area. So our our backyard, if you like, is is to the west of Manchester, really North Cheshire, um, North and South Cheshire, really, uh, and the uh, top north side of, of Shropshire to the to the sort of Welsh borders. And we're hoping to do a, a little bit of work over the borders in Wales as well. So we've got a really big big area to go at, but you know we've no desire to go much further in the rest of the UK, actually. In terms of consolidation, I mean, I, mean, mm. I think everyone knows it's going to be consolidation. Mm. What sort of time frame do you think that's going to happen over until you get to a point where, <clears throat> you know, we've got the stable, a bit like happened in the, <laughs> the, the cable industry? Oh. 
Well, it, mean, the, 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 analogy is, the analogy is a good one. Uh, no, I don't think it's going to take five years. I think the next three years you'll see a serious amount of consolidation in the uh, in our sector uh, because it does make absolute sense to start pulling these companies together. And the sooner you do it, the lower the costs. And, um, you know, I was talking to you earlier about, you know, the, the importance of getting standards in this industry so that we do get capital efficient consolidation and that we're able to merge these companies efficiently and start delivering services across them. Because the people, uh, the thing that people often forget when you're trying to consume uh, any kind of network, you know, it, it isn't the network's capability of delivering it. You know, that's a sort of given. That's our day job, isn't it? But it's the IT stacks that sit on top of these networks that allow folks like you to buy from folks like me, you know, and uh, and that's a non-trivial investment in time and, and money. And so, you know, you're not going to go out and, and, and trade with with 25 outlets. It's just not going to happen because um, you haven't got the time and, 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 and the capital to probably do that. And it's just not worth the business case. So it's up to us as an outlet industry, really, to get ourselves and present ourselves as as a as a common, you know, interface really in, into into you guys, and of course the ultimate uh, common interface is consolidation, and, and that's um, that that will happen when the shareholders decide to happen. Don't forget, as as management of these these companies, you know, we don't own them. You know, these are owned by the uh, infrastructure funds and the investors because of the amount of capital that's required in fibre, and they'll say when it's right and proper to to consolidate you know our job in the meantime is to is to get on with the, the job in hand build the networks get the customers on it and you know try and do it as economically as we can and, and uh, on this point of standardization to mm. set i suppose to set a smooth path path to consolidation i know that you're working mm. on something called ananet yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me a bit more about that. Um, well, Ananet is just that, actually. It's a set of standards. So it's a standards-based approach to the consolidation of uh, of networks. So the really you, you, the output is a virtual large network rather than necessarily a you know a single company, because you know when a, a when you you consolidate companies, very often people run them as separate subsidiaries for a while while they figure out how the heck do you consolidate these. And the facts are it's pretty easy to consolidate at the layer one at the network level because there are standards there across all the optical layers and, and the, 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 the layer one and layer two, even layer two, you know, is, is all there to be had. It's, again, back in the IT stacks, it's the operational processes. You know, it's the onboarding processes, it's the in-life management, the moves and changes and all those things that actually make taking a network and being able to consume it with all the things that happen, you know, in the life of the, of the customer and that's the type of standards that we try and produce and funnily enough telecoms isn't very good as a an industry at producing operational standards of customer management very good at technical standards and that's why layer one and layer two is pretty easy but the operational standards uh, seem to be beyond it so i think if we can try and get to a point where we manage customers in a in a similar way at the very least we improve the the life of the isps and and then ultimately the you know the customer journey will become um, better as well. Let's talk about something that's <laughs> hot on the agenda every every on there. Overbuild. Overbuild. So, I mean, <laughs> my impression of from speaking to a few altnets is in the altnet community there's almost an unwritten rule. You know, don't let's not overbuild each other because that's just silly. Oh. But then the backdrop is you've got OpenReach who've pretty much said because of their target of 25 million they're going to be overbuilding pretty much everyone over time so i mean what are your thoughts about overbuild yeah. how much of your network has been overbuilt so far okay. is that a big worry or well i've got, I got quite strong views on it richard to be honest <laughs> by the way um i can't i can't prescribe what bt are going to do and yes they're going to ultimately want to defend as much as their corner of the can you know it's their pitch isn't it the last mile and we're on their, we're in their territory trying to eat their lunch. So you can't expect them to sit back and, and watch that happen. Um, and so we don't try and, and worry about overbuild with, with BT. Um, and in fact, you know, it, it, I, I can tell you that uh, we make extensive use of PIA, you know, passive infrastructure access, which is using the regulatory access to ducts and, and poles, which makes absolutely sense because you don't want to be 
sticking holes up and sticking extra poles in and all those kind of things are everywhere. Um, but actually, if you if you actually build after BT have built, I can tell you it's a lot easier because they've unblocked the ducts, they've put new poles up, and we save a whole pile of money. So the, 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 the quid pro quo is it's nice to be there first because you get first dabs on the customers, but equally coming a good second isn't bad either. Uh, and so we just don't mind where BT are building. We get on with it. And we've always competed with BT, you know, in the industry while I've been in it, and that ain't going to change. So stop worrying about that. Um, and we don't worry too much about uh, about Virgin either because they're a media company that uh, people tend to, to to want to buy media type um, products off them, uh, and 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 so we don't actually worry too much about that. But when it comes to the outlets, that's where I do get grumpy <laughs> because you know most of us are trying to be wholesale suppliers to people like yourselves and and the rest of the ISPs. And so for me, I will not be, I will not overbuild other outlets. Absolutely not. And the minute I smell there's any opportunity, uh, any chance of that happening, I'm straight onto it. And, and we've had to walk away from a number of builds. It builds we've actually finished design work on and things and said, well, we're just not going to build it because somebody else has started building there. And the frustration th thing is that, you know, whilst in, in the UK we enjoy this regulatory freedom for a, or a free-for-all that many European countries don't, where they have franchise areas. In the UK, um, you know, we prefer open and free competition. And um, the, the, the downside of that, of course, is you do get this bit of a free-for-all and it's not, you know, it's you know, it's just not acceptable. We go and start carving up the market between ourselves. That that would that would break the law. So you you can very easily end up in a situation that two of you are designing an area and you don't know what's happening. The first thing you find out is your guys meet her guys on the roads, and that is not on. That is a complete waste of capital. And you know, any any outlets, you know, I ain't listening to this. You know, I hope you you can understand what we, we're saying here because it, it, it's you cannot be any winners. We all need 30, 40 percent penetration in our business models, and that isn't going to happen um, if, if you've got too many outlets building areas. So, for, as for one, the minute we think there's another outlet in the area. And we make whatever inquiries we think we possibly can to try and figure that out before we start um, designing. And then once we start building, you know, we keep building. And we've stopped building places at least because we've come up against where other outlets are planning and building to. That's it. So our view is that we should cooperate with with other outlets in an area, and hence the Anna project, and and the the virtual large network where we'll actually try and consume their network. And in fact, we've got exactly that problem in Shropshire, where we've got a gigabit project there. We're going to build seventy thousand homes. We've already got two companies that have built parts of Shropshire, and um, that we've now got a subsidy to go and overbuild. And I really don't want to do it. So the best thing I can do is come to an arrangement with them to use their networks and I'll be doing the utmost I possibly can to do just that. So that's my view on it. Fantastic. <laughs> let, let, let's continue on the subject of, com well, both competing with BT and and in some cases having to pull out of areas because you, uh, you wrote a piece for ISP Review last year mm. um, about Ofcom, the DCMS and Altnets getting mugged. <laughs> What was all that about? <laughs> yeah, well, I was having a grumpy moment. I think. Well, you but, felt um, quite strongly about it. Yeah, that, I, I did actually, because I mean, I, I, you know, I hats off to you know to our regulatory environment. You know, there's some great things that happened. Local loop unbundling was a huge success. You've done some of it as well, and you know, it was a, a fantastic success, and it delivered massive benefit for the UK. We got more good. More choice of broadband, lower cost than virtually anywhere else. So that was that great. But, you know, Ofcom has its moments when it when it, it, it sort of loses the plot a bit. And I think it's lost the plot a little bit in, more recently. It's had to support BT quite a lot because the capital to come on the... Um, to, to it, it, BT had to go and raise a load of capital. They've got to give BT some oxygen to do that. We all understand that. But I think they've gone a bit far. And, you know, the... Um, Chief Exec of, uh, of BT's made it quite clear what he thinks about Altnets, you know, so I don't really need to repeat that. But we need to end up with a very healthy um, alternate network choice for the ISPs at the wholesale level, don't we? So, you know, if there's any threat to going back to a monopoly position, you know, that isn't going to happen in the UK, is it? So it's all a bit, all that is all a bit silly. And, you know, I think um, Ofcom went a bit too far. I think the whole Area 3 thing you know, where, he's, where we've all felt in the alternate community we got mugged, really. You know, they handed BT 
3 million homes, um, you know, move the price of FTTC up so it's being paid for by you guys and the, and the consumers, you know, and, at the, and on the other hand, you know, DCMS removed the subsidy that the alt-nets were getting for build area threes. You know, that wasn't, that didn't seem very fair to me and it was a, you know, a real kick, you know, from both DCMS and, and Ofcom really. And I think they took their eye off the ball there and just missed missed the trick a bit. And you, so you get those little moments, you know, we've had a few over the last 25 years but on balance, you know, we we do get some good regulatory successes. PIA has been a huge success. You know, it's it must have saved massive amounts of carbon in the economy, us not all having to dig trenches and put new poles up. And uh, PIA is working pretty well, to be fair, to uh, to open reach. You know, I think they've done a pretty good job at implementing it. Uh, we certainly consume it. Um, you know, I won't say flawlessly, but we it it, it does work. We you know we have a few silly moments with poles at the moment, where you're seeing a few multiple poles, because um, it's a bit bit tricky with um, replacing poles at the moment. You can't climb and stuff, so there's a few um, spots where it doesn't all quite work. But on balance, I think that's working uh, uh, pretty well. But we have to get to a fair and balanced position, don't we? Where ultimately we end up with multiple networks in the UK. We can't go back to a monopoly. We've got to go back to, you know, at least three networks or or maybe even more um, in the fullness of time. And so when the industry does consolidate, we do actually need um, to end up with some competitive um, full fibre networks across the whole UK. And hopefully Ofcom will, you know, see the errors that it has made and start to sort of start moving the dial again. It's done that in the past, so I don't see why it won't do it in the future. I remember, I, I imagine Ofcom are are quite happy with the way that things are panning out in, in terms of you know, winding all the way back to the mid-90s when mm. Ofcom was Oftel and they wanted infrastructure competition. They didn't get it, but yep. 30 years on, they are actually getting true infrastructure competition. Yeah, it is true infrastructure competition, but we don't want to get it at the price of destroying a load of capital, do we? Because somebody's got to pay for that at the end of the day, and and that would not be good. And there are things that we could do to get slightly more order, you know, in the chaos. And you know, I've talked to you about introducing the introduction of standards. You know, telecoms is not a good industry for the introduction of operational standards. It's poor, and yet there are some industries that have achieved absolute excellence of it. Aviation's one. Why? Because of the safety issues. So you can fly an aeroplane anywhere around the world and they're all operated the same way, aren't they? And that's because it's a pretty dangerous industry to get wrong. And because telecoms isn't a dangerous industry, we don't seem to bother with anything. So you get this chaos of operational standards. And we don't have a regulator that really spends much effort on worrying about things like that. And yet that has a big impact on the customer journey and the customer experience. And, and yet trying to talk to industry about standards other than highly technical standards, you know, like IEEE 802 and, you know, you know, 3GPP and all those standards. You know, we get all the technical standards and thank goodness we do because it works, but we just don't seem to get the operational standards, do we? And those are the things that really impact the customer and also impact the ISP's ability to be able to trade with multiple outlets. And until we get better at that, it is, you know, it's... it's you're going to waste a lot of energy. Yep. Last question. I think yeah, this sure. is a question where <laughs> you and Ofcom are both absolutely on the same side, mm. which is your view of the, using the word fibre to describe <laughs> services um, and in particular to describe fibre to the cabinet where what the customer's actually getting is the copper yeah. cable they've had for the last 50 years. Well, we might be on the same side of Ofcom now, but I've not been for the last decade. <laughs> Okay. You know, I mean, when when FTTC came out and someone had the great idea of calling it fibre, that was a complete, you know, that was that should have been shot at birth, shouldn't it? That's that was just terrible. You know, it was misleading the customer from day I, I, one. I, I can't really comment because our <laughs> FTTC products are called like fibre one and fibre two. Although you know that that is the industry but norm, it's, but it's wrong. I mean, you can have you can have an ADSL copper line that will run fa faster than an FTCC copper line. And you would have thought it ludicrous to call ADSL fibre, wouldn't you? Well, it's no, it's just as ludicrous calling FTCC, you know, um, fibre. It's copper that goes a bit faster in a good day, isn't it? 
That's all it is. It's terrible. <laughs> and how the advertising standards are they have let you get away with it for so long and 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 all i can say is the reason ofcom didn't react is because politically it sounded better didn't it that we were fiber in the country when actually we were just shortening the copper and misleading customers and and, and seriously you know a, a joke about it but it isn't funny when you actually go to an area and you tell people that you're fiber in the country and they all think they've got fiber we've done a cracking job at, at lying to to the public about about fiber haven't we in the past or fttc and trying to unwind that unpick that now it's it's not really funny when customers think they've got something that they haven't and and full fiber is going to unlock huge potential that we're not you know the the limitations that we live with with even short copper you know um it, it, are quite significant and you're going to see you know an explosion of uh, of potential with with fiber because it isn't just the it, it, you know the the headline speeds that you see you know the latency its ability to react the reliability of the of the products is much higher and of course that's going to open up the whole the whole world of internet of things and and cloud based computing and and all these things and uh, and uh, you know it will also be a major facilitator of, of 5G particularly when we get to sort of small cell 26 gig and all that kind of stuff so fiber is going to unlock huge economic potential and um you know finally we can describe fiber as as fiber <laughs> absolutely <laughs> look Neil, that's been fantastic. On that note, we'll finish off. But thank you so much for You're very welcome, sharing your views today. <laughs> and all. thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Yeah, yeah. Cheers, Richard.